that was explaining to me that I would be living at home several nights a week. I kept asking him, what do you mean? Well, I thought I would be in a dorm. It was like in that moment, all of the dreams that I had pinned everything on about escaping home, they just got crushed. Not many Hollywood murder mysteries ever took a more dramatic turn than police are describing in a couple of savage Beverly Hills killings. The victims were a man and his wife. He helped finance such movie hits as Rambo, First Blood, Part Two, and Red Heat. Today at approximately 1.20 p.m., Beverly Hills police detectives arrested Joseph Lyle Menendez, 22. In Los Angeles, two brothers have pleaded innocent. There is no issue as to who killed Jose and Mary Louise Menendez. Why they were killed is what the focus of all of our evidence will be on. We view the abuse excuse as a bullshit offense. I mean, 51 witnesses. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard of that in a battered person's case. I would have ignored Kitty and just went up to that door and knocked. I got so angry because she could have protected her kids and she didn't. Did you ask him not to? <laughs> yes. How did you ask him not to? I just told him, I don't, I don't. That was heartbreaking for everybody in the courtroom. Everybody, everybody. I remember being terrified about taking the stand. I was really, really, really afraid. So afraid, I remember the day I was supposed to testify, I took my Xanax and I took Lyle's Xanax. I couldn't handle it. They had to cancel my first day on the stand because of it. And then I got watched when I took Xanax after that because I was just, my anxiety was through the roof. The prosecution is wrapping up its case in the Menendez brothers murder trial. Eric, the younger of the two brothers who admit to killing their parents, was on the witness stand where he was grilled about his claim that the murders followed years of sexual abuse. Eric Galen Menendez, M-E-N-E-N-D-E-Z. I remember when I first took the stand, I was blanking out. I, 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 it was terrible. And after that, I just began to shut down. What do you believe was the originating cause of you and your brother ultimately winding up shooting your parents? Um, me telling. You telling what? Me telling Lyle that, uh, you telling Lyle what? Was it you telling Lyle about something that was happening? My dad. My dad. I remember when I first got on the stand, I started shutting down. I started to describe what my dad had, had been doing to me from the time I was a kid, and I just started to be able to talk about it, and I couldn't even think. I could, my brain would begin to shut down. Can you answer the question? Yes. Okay, was you telling Lyle what? My dad had been molesting me. And did you want something from your brother? Is that why you told him? I just wanted it to stop. Were you seeking help from your brother? Yes. In my heart of hearts, listening to that, if I take off my reporter hat and become a member of the jury, you know, I believed it. I, I just did. I'm Eric Menendez. I'm speaking to you from the Donovan Correctional Facility in California near the Mexican border. I'm serving a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. I've heard many different versions of my life told in the media, and those stories are fiction. I think it's time people hear the truth from my own words without the restrictions of a courtroom. You may think you know my story, but really you couldn't possibly because I'm telling it to you now for the first time. How did you feel at 18 about the fact that your father was having sex with you? I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. I believed him. Straightforward. I believed him. 
because of the noises I heard coming out of the room, the fact that Kitty would not allow me to go down the hallway to, to find out what was going on, how I wasn't allowed to see the boys right after they came out of the bedroom, um, all these different things just, just clicked. And that's when I really, really said to myself, you know what, that son of a bitch was actually doing what they said he was doing back in that bedroom. I wanted to, uh, to end the uh, sex with my dad. And did you have some expectation of how that was going to happen? Yes. And what did you expect? I was going to go to college. And how was that going to end the sex with your dad? I was going to get away from him. And, uh, and I wasn't going to sleep at the house anymore. Well, I found that the testimony of the two, Lyle and Eric, was so impressive and so believable that I personally could not have formed any other opinion that they are telling the truth. Why would anybody get up and say the things they said otherwise? I wasn't buying, you know, what Lyle and Eric were, were selling. You know, there was all of this talk about, you know, the parents and incest and, and rape, and we were offended by the way they spoke about their parents and how they spoke of the dead. He was saying that he had, he had told me never to tell Lyle and that he had warned me not to do that. And, and now uh, he said that Lyle was going to tell everyone and, and that uh, it was my fault. And, and now Lyle was going to tell everyone and he was not going to let that happen. He was nine days on the stand, which means nine nights, nine mornings waiting to get on the stand. And it was day after day of telling all of the secrets that are the most shameful, humiliating, terrible things to the whole world that's watching live on TV. It just seemed endless. It was crying and sobbing, and the jurors were, some of them were crying also. And at that point, I go, boy, we got some problems here. The longer the trial went on, and the more people testified about them, and the more they testified, the more I came to believe their story. After nearly five months of trial, attorneys will now get their last chance to drive it all home. It is called final arguments. This is a first degree premeditated slaughter of two people. They cared about their sons. They might not have been perfect, but they were human beings and they had the right to live. And it's the people's position that the sexual abuse is here to make the parents look so bad that you don't care that they're dead. With Mr. Kuriyama on a tennis court at 5 o'clock in the morning when he was 10 years old, drilled and grilled for three hours, and then went to school, and then taken around for more tennis courts for more hours of drilling and grilling, and then went back home to have dinner, which was like jeopardy, and more drilling and grilling, and then had to satisfy his father's perversion, and then had to do his homework till 10 o'clock at night. And he wants to talk about this kid not working. You are going to be given the instruction on what's known as imperfect self-defense. What that means is if someone is truly in fear, actual fear, that they're about to be killed or they're about to, for example, in our case, be raped, that person, if they act to defend themselves, can be convicted of no more than manslaughter. Leslie, she might pull it off. They might get off, you know? Um, that's how much doubt was put into to the case. I, th I think we all expected that we still are going to get a guilty verdict, but it just takes one juror, one juror, to say, uh-uh, I buy that. Two Los Angeles juries are deliberating the fate of the Menendez brothers, who admit they shot their wealthy parents to death in 1989. I can't even describe to you what it's like to have your life in the hands of people you don't know. I had no idea what they believed or who they believed. It was surreal and almost agonizing, waiting for the jury to decide day after day after day while I was sitting in a jail cell having no idea what would happen. 
It became obvious immediately that it was men against women. The men in our jury had a real hard time accepting the premise that teenage boys can be abused by their father. I do not believe that the Menendez brothers were molested. I don't think they were in imminent fear. A lot of the female reporters were believing about the sexual abuse. And a lot of the male uh, reporters and the cameramen were not, were not. They thought it was, it was just an act. How, what do you suppose the population of this country is in terms of those who believe that boys who suffer enough have a right to blow their parents away bloodily? So every day for a month, we deliberated. A poll taken this morning shows that the jury believes there is no reasonable probability of our reaching a verdict. Therefore, uh, the court finds that the uh, jury is hopelessly deadlocked and uh, declares a mistrial. They had come with a hung jury for me first. We regret to inform the court that we are unable to come to a unanimous decision on any of these three counts. And then ultimately they came with a hung jury for my brother. And I remember that Lyle had smiled. And I was watching this on camera and I was thinking to myself, don't smile. Because the hung jury, people have this sense that we thought that was a victory. That was a terrible verdict. Well, I'm disappointed. Eric's been in jail for, you know, almost four years. And he's going to be in jail probably for at least another one. That's miserable. It was deliberate, premeditated, malicious, first degree, double homicide. I was surprised. I, I just, I recall shaking my head and I said, wow. I do not believe any jury will ever convict Eric Menendez of first degree murder. I do not think a decision can be reached. It's too divisive an issue, there's too much information, and I think that uh, the district attorney should just end it. I announced immediately this case is going to be retried. You're talking about two homicides, two murders, two first-degree murders. I think it's political. The district attorney's office behavior was shameful in this case, given the fact that from what we understand, the majority of the jury did not support first degree murder. Did the district attorney's office have egg on its face after the hung jury? Of course they did. It was an embarrassment for his office. The defense of parental abuse was a fair defense, and the first jury bought it, at least enough bought it, to not convict. That verdict meant that everything would go over again, that the entire trial would have to be done all over again. The idea that we would have to do it all over again in public was not something that we thought was a victory at all. There was an extensive delay between the end of the first trial and the beginning of the second trial. The delay of a year and a half. When I get some very firm dates so that these matters can be resolved without delays. And it was an extremely long time, and I was in the county jail, and I wanted to, I wanted to get back to trial because I wanted to get it over with. There's heightened pressure on the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office to win this round, to reverse a humiliating decade-long run of high-profile defeats. We knew that we wanted to get this one because they had committed such brutal acts of murder. Trial number two, they changed, but they didn't go low key on the prosecution. They went with David Kahn, who was even more hard charging. In this case, the death penalty is an appropriate punishment. David Kahn in any DA's office in the country would be among the top three trial lawyers. And I was supremely confident he can handle Leslie. During the retrial, I was the prosecutor along with David Kahn. We like doing what we do, which is basically putting people who need to be put away into jail. I'll be frank. When David and I looked at that first trial, we saw basically a train wreck. So they bring in David Kahn and Carol Nahara, and I think the message was going to be, we're bringing in our A-team here. We're going to just send the message that it's no halt bar. I was lucky the first time you got your hung jury. After the first trial, there probably would have been a resolution. Had there not been 
the media storm. Because what it does is it just magnifies, it makes everything so extreme. Don't you feel some measure of success in that you were able to literally say here, or convince some of the people on the jury at least, that child abuse here was an excuse for murder? No, we never argued that child abuse is an excuse for murder. What we argued is child abuse creates a, a terrible fear. If anything neatly symbolizes our national confusion on the subject, it is the hung juries in the recent cases of Lyle and Eric Menendez. A triumph of compassionate justice or as cynical a piece of jury manipulation as you're ever likely to see? I worry about the message that this sends, that if you can come up with an abuse excuse, you can literally get away with murder. Yeah, the abuse excuse may minimize what individuals have gone through. I think to play it down or to satirize it is unwise, unfair, and possibly truly unjust. Being abused is never an excuse for anything. It's an explanation for what happened and why. The reaction by the public was, everybody's got their problems, and you don't get to shotgun your parents even if you were abused. The nation hated these young men not for who they actually were, but for the media-created caricatures that made for much better copy. We're gonna get people coming in who think that these, these despicable movies or these ludicrous books are what really happened. What's the problem, please? They shot and killed my parents. Oh my God, I Sir? can't believe Sir, can you repeat that, please? Oh God, please? Hello? Are you still there? Are you okay? Hello? I saw one of the television movies that had come out after the first trial. There is not a single scene in that movie that happened. Now what are we going to do? We have to kill him. Dominic Dunn was there, and he and Leslie had kind of a feud going on. Dominic Dunn hated Leslie Abramson. She was the champion of the underdog and the defendant, and she typified to him the sort of soft-hearted liberal point of view. I think that Dominic, although he came in thinking that the boys were, were guilty and should be strung up, actually was quite moved by the, their testimony. Dominic usually took the side of the prosecution. Dunn was the source for one of the two quickie TV docudramas made about the case and broadcast before the second trial. His was predictably hostile and mean-spirited. Spoiled rich kids kill parents for loot. Everything became so polarized in the media because so much attention was brought to the, the case. And then when OJ got arrested, it just made everything just so much worse. I think the DA's office in California, they needed vindication in the public eye, and they were going to try to extract that at the expense of the Menendez brothers. So my dad worked at Hertz. And it's at Hertz that they started the campaign with O.J. Simpson. And O.J. and my dad had a good relationship. And O.J. would come over to the house. And I remember him in the backyard tossing the football to Lyle and so on. And it was a, it was a big deal that this larger-than-life personality was over there. And that's when I first got to know O.J. He was kind of a, one of those childhood heroes. And then that famous Bronco chase began to happen. And so I watched the chase along with the rest of America just basically in shock. If he, he gets arrested, the door pops open at the end of the hall, and there's OJ. And he sees me and says, Hi, Eric. And I said, Hi, OJ. And he gets put into the cell next to me. That's where he stayed for about three months. And OJ did not know anything about the county jail, of course. Well, how could he? Uh, he'd never been arrested before, just like I hadn't. But at that point, I'd been in jail about four years. We talked about the court system and what it's like to be on trial. And so I'd already talked to OJ about possibly he should get a different attorney. One of Leslie's close friends was Johnny Cochran. In fact, they worked in the same building together. And so while I was on the phone with Leslie, we put Johnny on, I said, OJ, let me put you on the phone with Johnny Cochran. And Johnny, of course, was a fabulous attorney and going to be a good fit for him.
In Los Angeles, this is day two of jury selection and the retrial of Eric and Lyle Menendez and the 1989 shotgun deaths of their parents. The judge knows by the second trial what the defense is going to do. And the judge was not sympathetic and he excluded the details of the abuse that had been in the first trial. One thing, the judge is already making uh, indications he's going to severely limit the defense. He's going to limit our right to put on the facts, which is quite extraordinary. And we think we have a real problem with getting a, a fair and unbiased jury. So, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot more than that to make you think you have serious problems in the Justice Department. His goal uh, in that trial was to get a conviction. There is no doubt about it. It was really painful to watch, but there was nothing that I could do. There was a sense that there was something going on behind the scenes that we were not privy to. And I don't know what it was, but what I do know is that before the second trial started, Judge Weisberg said that he had reconsidered the significant rulings in the first trial. And he then proceeded to officially and systematically reverse all of his important decisions. And essentially, right in front of us, he took away my entire defense. I think after the first trial, when it appeared, or at least people were saying, he wasn't able to control Leslie Abramson, I think that had an impact on him. Do I think the judge said, oh, therefore, the defense has to lose the second time? No. He has still got to make the right rulings, but if he thinks that these guys got away with something, that's going to impact the rulings. One thing that we have asked the judge to do is to limit the so-called abuse excuse, to limit evidence that has nothing to do with this case, limit evidence going back years and years because the defendants themselves say that they did not kill their parents because they were abused. What they said was that they killed their parents because they were in fear of their parents. I don't know what was in Judge Weisberg's head when he changed his rulings on some significant issues, but I do know that David Kahn and Carol Nahara prepared really well and prepared written motions that had not been prepared in the first trial. Well, the difference between the first trial and the second trial was uh, the realization by the judge that he had lost control of the first trial and admitted into evidence testimony that probably shouldn't have been allowed. Leslie, uh, she used every player, every play, deflated the ball, and she pulled every trick. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean in a good lawyerly way. She did what she had to do to, to hang that jury. We were not allowed to talk about any psychological trauma we went through and any terrorizing or intimidation or fear that occurred in the house that, were, that was excluded from the trial. And he went through each witness and said they can't testify to that. They're not allowed to testify to that. And having been the, the, the judge in the first trial, he knew exactly what the most important aspects of our case was. Our case was based on a just a history of fear that I had of my mom and my dad. How do you not let a jury hear something that profoundly affected these kids from, the, from virtually from the time they were born? That's horrible. The rulings he made certainly lend credence to Abramson's claim that he wants to see them convicted, and I believe he did. For people to say that Judge Weisberg changed a ruling or did something because he wanted to see a conviction is, is unfair to him. You know, I think the judge's reversals were probably based on good law on the one hand, but also on public pressure. The fact of the matter is that a lot of people were outraged that the jury did not convict these two. It wasn't even a feeling. It was clear. The mood in the courtroom was focused on conviction for first-degree murder. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. OJ's acquittal was so shocking to everybody and to the district attorney's office. Our second trial started within days of his acquittal. OJ's verdict had a very negative effect on our case. But I'd also like to thank the, the lawyers uh, on our prosecution team. I am honored to have like a darkened time for all court proceedings in Los Angeles. Because his verdict was so shocking, there was a sense of extreme injustice that happened. And now we're gonna have to write it with every defendant that comes up. And 
we were the next defendant. There was a sense, you know, a desperation in the DA's office. We needed a win. We had to win. Well, the LA DA's office did need a win at this point. However, this is a case that they should have won. In my opinion, this was first degree murder. For the district attorney's office to lose so many high profile cases, and, and OJ was, I mean, my God, that was a, a black eye on that department. Of course they're gonna double their efforts and go after the Menendez brothers. It's failure, it's an embarrassment. They're not gonna lose this one. You know, they weren't gonna let those kids walk. Unlike the first trial in which TV coverage was permitted, there were only still cameras in court this time. I think that's unfortunate. I think the press should have a First Amendment right to be in there, and I don't think a judge should just get to decide. The prosecution were all business, cold, calculated, and direct. What they played up in the second trial was the gory, brutal murder. It was gruesome, and those photos were gruesome. They downplayed the sexual abuse. The prosecution seems to be taking a different tack this time, one that seems to say, even if the Menendez brothers were abused, what difference does it make? Overall, we've, we've demonstrated uh, fabrication and premeditation and a very strong case of uh, a killing uh, for reason of greed. David Kahn's conduct, I thought, was shameful. I really do. He came in like a hitman. What right did he have to look inside those kids' minds if these kids were the love slaves of their father? We can't comprehend that. It shows a callousness that doesn't serve him very well. We believe that they're as guilty as could be. We believe that the law says this is the way the case should be presented, and we're going to do that. Because we wanted to get it right, and we thought, and I still believe, right means they are convicted. Once again, they intend to talk a lot about abuse, and the jury is going to have to decide what did the abuse have to do with the events of that particular day. In the first trial, he allowed us to present testimony of those relatives, friends, teachers, and others who helped us create a mosaic of the warped family life that the brothers themselves would then testify about. In the second trial, he eliminated most of those witnesses during the guilt phase and left Eric to tell the horror tale himself. I wasn't allowed to talk about Lyle telling me that he was being touched by his dad. Wasn't allowed to talk about that. Jill wanted me desperately to talk about intergenerational abuse because it was. Judge Stice Weisberg said it wasn't relevant. The judge made a very specific ruling. He said, I have to testify first before any other defense witnesses can testify. And so the jury was looking at me very skeptically. Eric had to carry the whole second trial. It was an impossible feat. It was a very emotional trial. A lot of ups and downs. Eric was incredibly emotional and it was very, very upsetting to see him on the stand and the crying and you know you don't you don't generally get to see that most people hold it in but he did not it's understandable how a person would agree to have his voice reported for the purpose of getting his own self-serving story before the public he proceeded to tell his life story or give to Norman Novelli the information that he wanted to send out to the public. And within all of those 25 recordings, we found one nugget of information that hurts the defendant. When you look at someone like Lau Menendez, you have to ask yourself, is he the type of person who would make a, a stupid mistake like that? And the answer to that is yes. that my relatives have seen us go through as children, without that testimony, it's very difficult to convey the trauma, the terror, and the, uh, all of the bad things that happened in my house. It's, it's almost impossible for me to do it by myself. 
uh, because I could say it, but it's just me saying it. What was so unfair about that was you have a hung jury. You presented your defense. There's going to be another trial. So they have their next case, and then the judge completely guts their entire defense. They have no defense. I found it troubling that um, there were very different rulings in the second trial than the first one. Um, there were so many changes, uh, and so many of them went to the heart of what was successful in the first case that I thought it was troubling. My belief is everything should have come in. Literally, just take all the evidence that the DA has and all the evidence that the defense has and put it in the trial and let the, the jury decide on what my penalty should be. Even the issue with the notes. Yeah, there's a lot of shock and awe when it was determined that Leslie Abramson had asked Dr. Vickery to alter his notes. I thought it was like a death knell for her whole career. When it's a, a crime of this magnitude, everything has to come in. All of the DA's evidence, all of the defense's evidence, the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything. This is a case that involves my interaction with my parents from the time I was born. Everything is relevant. So when the defense is trying to, to keep stuff out of it, the DA is, I didn't have anything to hide. It was literally, let the jury decide on everything, even the issue with the notes. Let everything in. Yeah, this... Uh question about change, making changes in the notes uh, prior to the first trial came out of the blue. Leslie was accused of trying to influence the testimony of a psychiatrist who testified. It became a big hullabaloo. I was meeting with Leslie Abramson, preparing, because I was scheduled to be a witness. And she was reviewing my notes, and she said, wait a minute, this can't be in here. You've got to take this out. And so we have, would have an argument about that. And I'd say, Leslie, you can't take that out because that's part of my notes. And, and look, it doesn't make a difference. You can read this one way or you can read it another way. There were some statements such as, we can't take it anymore. And Leslie says, that's got to come out because that shows premeditation. And I said, no, it doesn't. It just shows that they were terrified and they had to put a stop to the abuse. Or Eric says, I'm thinking about killing myself. I'm at the end of my rope. She says, well, you can't put that in there because that shows that he's been thinking about doing something to his parents. And she exploded and she pointed at me and she said, look, you take that out of the notes or you're out. I was really in a dilemma because I was uh, such an integral part of the case in the sense that this has been a real struggle to get at the family dysfunction. Nobody knows that and can explain that except me. So I'm thinking, if I'm not allowed to testify here, it's a death sentence. <sighs> so I took that out. I took those sections out of my notes and I prepared a second edition of the notes without the material that Leslie objected to. He had presented notes in the first trial, and they were used, and I couldn't find the notes anywhere. And so Leslie's secretary got a call from Leslie saying, send Dr. Vickery's notes to the prosecution. And so she pulled the file, and she pulled out the original notes and sent that to the prosecution. So when Dr. Vickery started testifying, David started cross-examining him. And Leslie jumped up outraged, saying, you know, you said we couldn't go into this. And David was like, well, it's in his notes. And once the notes come in, all the notes come in. And she was beside herself. She's like, no, it's not. And David, who was sitting next to her, kind of leaned over. And he was like, you're right, it's not in your notes. He's like, your notes are different from my notes. And then he just jumped up and announced that the notes had been tampered with. It dawned on me that he has got the original copy of the notes. And the prosecution said, why is that? And I said, because I was told by defense counsel that if I didn't do that, that I would not be able to testify. And he said, and which defense counsel? And I said, Leslie Abramson. And then the whole courtroom blew up. We were like, oh my gosh, you know, like nobody ever does that. Yeah, oh my gosh, she's going to be disbarred. And I mean, it was amazing. And, and especially when it happens and is discovered in court, then that's a really dramatic moment. I did my best to write down and keep track of what was happening in the trial and my observations. 
uh, during the trial. I believe this is the uh, questioning by David Kahn, page 18 of the notes differs on his copy and the prosecutor's copy. Abramson said to rewrite page 18 because too prejudicial, so he deleted some information. You know, at this point, my radar is going off. Something is, something is happening here. This is pretty significant. I was, was just amazed. I, was, I couldn't believe it. It's like, that can't be happening. And we stopped proceedings, closed the courtroom, and she, uh, she, she was at the whole time just shaking her head and, and just you know, very, very forcefully. Judge Reisberg says, you know, do you want to take the stand and tell us your side? And that's when she took the fifth and said no. So at this point, we knew something had happened. I believe we, hadn't, we didn't hear from Leslie Abramson throughout the rest of the trial. She stopped being an active participant in the case, and Charlie Gessler pretty much took over. I think when the Vickery incident happened and the notes were being changed, then it just validated what the judge had sort of turned to throughout the second trial, which was they were trying to, the defense, pull a fast one on the court and on the jury. At the time, I thought it was going to have an impact, and I thought it was going to be the nail that was going to make the jury come back with death. Weisberg is not going to let the jury even consider our presentation after they heard us build it for four months. It has been hell. At the end of the case, at the very end of the case, the judge altered which instructions would be allowed to the jury. He did not allow imperfect self-defense of an honest but unreasonable belief that your life is in danger. He took that away. He said that the jury is not even allowed to consider it. And he made that decision at the end. And he said, well, it was because he had to hear what evidence was in the case. But he was the judge in the entire first trial, so he knew exactly what was going to be testified to, and um, there was nothing that could be done. He destroyed these kids' opportunity to present the only defense they had. And it was a valid defense. It was viable. It went to the heart of the case. Weisberg, in effect, told the jury they couldn't do nothing other than convict them of first-degree murder. That's disgraceful, really. It really is. I'm very pleased with the rulings of the court. I think that uh, it, it, it assists the prosecution in our efforts to obtain a first-degree murder conviction in this case. I think what he's done is made himself the 13th juror and the one with the most power. I think he has made factual determinations and weighing of evidence determinations that are simply not within the purview of a judge. And it's really shocking to me and outrageous that he did this. The judge was still worried that the jury would not come back with the right verdict, that he didn't allow the imperfect self-defense instructions. So at the end, he then pulled that out from under us. Basically, the jury was left with first degree or not guilty. It was absolutely heartbreaking when the, when the verdicts came in. They got it wrong, and they got it wrong because the truth wasn't allowed into the trial. It was a very, very sad experience. The brothers, Eric and Lyle, showed very little emotion as the verdicts were read. Guilty of first-degree murder with special circumstances in the shotgun deaths of their parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez. The brothers could face the death penalty. For me to convict a first degree murder, it was an emotional decision. And I remember sitting there saying, based on what I know right now, I'm very confident in what I'm doing. I have no doubts whatsoever. With all of the judge's reversals from that first trial to the second trial, and how he had not allowed more than half of the defense to be presented, the notes issue at the end, and then him not giving the jury instructions at the end. I, I knew it wouldn't end well. And I wasn't surprised when the jury verdict came back guilty. But hearing it was still shocking. Some jurors said later they believed much of what we told them, even in this judicially crippled defense, especially about the molestation. But evidently, even the more sympathetic jurors couldn't find a legal justification for anything less than first degree. 
When he heard the guilty verdict, District Attorney Gil Garcetti raised his fist in a victory gesture. He's no hero. Connor's no hero here. He can walk around with all the smirks on his face he wants. He can think he scored a victory. He scored no victory. He was the anyone. Mickey Mouse could have won that case with Weisberg's ruling. On Monday, the penalty phase of the trial gets underway. That will determine whether Eric and Lyle Menendez face life in prison or the death penalty. Once you decide it's murder, it's hard to accept the idea that sexual abuse was a factor in, in the murders. The child sexual abuse should have come in, and especially in the penalty phase. You do become a different person when you are abused as a child. It does affect your psyche. We can't pretend that it doesn't. And I know sitting here today, having represented dozens and dozens of people over the years who were sexually abused, that it has a very profound effect. I understand the closing arguments, as you might have expected, were very emotional. Yes, extremely. In fact, the very last closing argument given by Lyle's attorney, Charlie Gessler, it seemed as if he was almost about to cry. His voice was very emotional, pleading for Lyle Menendez's life. And the prosecutor actually sounded angry. He was shouting across the room, pointing at Lyle Menendez, saying he had black eyes and dead eyes, and th those eyes should be dead and pointing at Eric Menendez and calling him a liar and saying that he's always been a liar, but just now he's run out of tricks. So the state really wanting the death penalty and, of course, the defense begging for mercy. Not knowing whether I would be allowed to live or sentenced to die, I really wasn't sure which was worse, which was better. Life in prison forever or to be put to death. Jurors have just announced that they have reached a verdict in the penalty phase of the Menendez brothers' retrial. Because these are highly notorious defendants, thanks to y'all, they think it's a, it's a free-for-all for inhumanity. After the verdicts, we were all searching for some ray of hope. Lyle tells me that he wants to marry Anna Erickson. I got married at Folsom to Eric in a visiting room. Eric was very nervous, and he was pacing back and forth. When I walked out of the prison, there was media that started snapping pictures. Why would you marry a guy you can't cohabit, and he's in for life? I was interested in her. What is a successful day in prison? It really just means whether or not you are at peace and the people around you are at peace. It's been 21 years. I can't wait to hug him again.